Is this the same as an autobiography? Like, you know, because even even when um, you first approached me, I was dead set against it because I was like, well, dude, like, I'm, I just turned 40. Like, why am I at the end of my life now? Like, I'm thinking that autobiographies are for anyone that has a six on the left digit of their age and they have something worthy to look back at. And I'm like, why am I looking in the rear view mirror? Um, you know, right, right after undone comes out or whatever, like why a memoir is a memoir just basically diet autobiography. I think that the question is more about, it, it partly is what you're saying about how much of the life that there's memoirs that focus on one aspect of the life. Uh, Patty Smith's books are a great example where she's going to focus on her relationship to downtown and Maplethorpe at a certain period in her life, but it informs the larger story. Uh, autobiographies, generally speaking, are taken to be the whole life or as much of the life as you can do. But I don't know. There's probably a, a, a very smart academic distinction that I don't know. I just know it from the actual books that I've worked on with you and with other people. And the best way I can describe the sly one is that I did George's and then I did Brian Wilson's book with him. Mm -hmm. And those, it's not, I wouldn't say in a kind of glib way that it's a combination of those two. But it, there are some ways in which it is an interesting midpoint between those two. Obviously, I thought for funk purposes, George is the New Testament, Sly is the Old Testament. So there's that kind of idea, too, of your, you go backwards in time and you do the New Testament version with George. You get P-Funk and highly conceptual, narrative-driven funk and a lot of characters and a real good awareness of how cartoons work and Davy Crockett caps and all that kind of stuff, George's version. Mm -hmm. And then Sly's version was the version that was the Old Testament. That's maybe a little bit more earnest and yoked to the time and had to burn out so something new could exist. So I thought about George a lot. And then Brian Wilson was somebody who had very clear mental illness that he was struggling with, as well as substance problems. I, I think for Sly, it's more substance issues. But it really changed the shape and the nature of his memory. And so in the Brian book, we said right at the beginning, we're going to have to deal with that forthrightly. We're going to have to talk about in some way how memory works and doesn't work. Because you, for any of us, I mean, you were young and you have a great memory. But the fact of the matter is, I don't remember many, many things of my own life. And I'm I live a relatively clean, boring life, and there's a lot that I just can't recover as I get older, let alone if you're 80 and you had 60 years of fame and drugs. It's right. not just, I mean, the worst drug in a way is fame. And so I really wanted to think through that with him. And so going back and asking an 80-year-old to reimagine what was the 60-year-old you? What was the 40-year-old you? What was the 20-year-old you? That's a bizarre exercise. Do you I remember mean, the you, first question that you asked him? We talked about, uh, uh, no, the first question that I asked him when we were writing the proposal was I was just trying to loosen him up. And I, I asked about Woodstock and it didn't take because it was, I don't think it's that interesting to him in some way because there's the life lived and then the life remembered. And I don't know if he knew, you know, you just play the gig and then later it's a legend. Like, did he not know that that was the paradigm shift of his life? He knew uh, the next day he knew the concert was a big deal. But one of the things he said that was interesting is that when the movie came out the next year and he was a movie star, that was a secondary acceleration that maybe people now don't fully understand that they. Yeah. The movie for us is the concert. The the movie you know, is what made Woodstock Woodstock. I don't think Woodstock made Woodstock at all. I totally agree. And I the think idea of Woodstock. He felt that in the moment, like like to us, we see through the movie, like your film, to the event. And so we're we're thinking we're seeing how important the event was. What we're actually seeing is that the movie brought it to people's attention. The first question I asked him where I got a real answer was we were just kind of loosening him up. And, and I said, just tell me a random story, just something funny that happened. And he told me a story that I didn't think would make the book at the time. It did. 
which is about giving a stolen car to Etta James, where he, <laughs> I, I didn't know she was part of his story. I mean, I knew that was another drug troubled, you know, superstar, but I didn't, I wasn't aware of any crossover between them. I knew weird crossovers like her singing, you know, Paul Simon songs or laying on the floor of the studio as people would walk by for sugar on the floor. But I didn't, I didn't know that she and Sly had crossover. And evidently they were friendly and she dropped by and they were hanging out and probably using and she asked if she could borrow a car. And he said, no, I'll just give you one. So, so he went out and he gave her a car. She was driving with a boyfriend to Texas. I believe I may get some details of this wrong. It's in the book. And then he gets a call a couple of weeks later and they're in Texas. And she says, I got pulled over. Uh, the car was stolen. And he's like, oh, I didn't know that. And he said, you didn't mention me, did you? And she said, no, 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 uh, uh, E, the boyfriend I was driving with. Like, he was very uh, uh, straight about it, but didn't mention you. He just said, we bought this from someone. We had no idea. We have the right papers. And then I said, so you didn't know it was stolen? He's like, no, I probably knew. I just, he's had a lot of cars. <laughs> what year is this? I just didn't think it would come up. Like, well, you don't think that that's going to happen. You just, you, the papers, I don't know how it worked back then in California, but whatever the fake papers were to make it look like title had been transferred. He thought they were good enough. And so it was a very <laughs> random story to me. And I thought at the time, I don't think this is going to make it because I don't really know where this fits into the larger story. It turned out that it did fit into this kind of craziness period where fame just takes you. 